Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Pittsburgh guests who are joining our 340 Remaking Cities delegates for this evening's address by the Royal, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, followed by a reception right outside the doors here. Uh, my name is Don Carter. I'm co-director of the Remaking Cities Congress, and my co-chair, co-director, is Joel Mills of the American Institute of Architects. And so it's my honor right now and pleasure to introduce Mark Camlet, who's the provost of Carnegie Mellon University and my boss. <laughs> and he's been at Carnegie Mellon since 1976. He's a distinguished professor of economics, and he's going to give welcoming remarks from Carnegie Mellon University. Mark? Don, thank you very much. It's a distinct pleasure for me to be able to extend Regards and greetings and thanks from Carnegie Mellon's president, new president, Dr. Subra Suresh, and on behalf of CMU's Board of Trustees. Dr. Suresh is in Scotland today as I speak, but otherwise would be here in person and I'm pleased to extend his regards on his behalf. I hope that uh, some of you got the chance to uh, be on Carnegie Mellon's campus uh, last evening for the intersection of arts and technology. And I hope you uh, enjoyed that for those of you who are able to attend. Um, I'm going to be very brief. I just want to say that CMU is extremely pleased to be able to partner with the American Institute of Architects on this 2013 Remaking Cities Congress. We are pleased and proud of the fact that we were a part of the first Remaking Cities Conference in 1988, which was also convened by AIA, as well as at the time, the Royal Institute of British Architects, as today. And we are delighted that Pittsburgh is host again, and that uh, particularly delighted that Prince Charles is a, the honorary chair. You know, Pittsburgh and CMU have both transformed a good bit in the last 25 years. 25 years ago, Pittsburgh was an industrial city on the steep, on steep decline. It's a technology city today that's exciting and thriving with neighborhoods with young and dynamic entrepreneurial residents. And we as a university have changed a lot as well from a regional university to truly a global university. And I think the city and the university have done these changes together in partnership, and I think it's a model for city and university cooperation. The urban issues that I know you'll be tackling tomorrow and to some, today, to some degree already today are at the core of CMU's own teaching and research interests, including urban systems, sustainable design, intelligent transportation, connected communities, brownfield recovery, social equity, public health, public-private finance, and many more. And we are very proud of our own tradition that so many of parts of our campus, so many academic departments, require our students to undertake coursework and studio work and capstone projects that take them out into the communities as an essential part of their education to work on real life problems. And we believe that when those students graduate with those real world experiences, they are better prepared and eager to be engaged in making cities better. We have research institutes on campus like the Remaking Cities Institute, the Scott Energy Institute, Traffic 21, and others that are also engaged in urban problems that result in real solutions. We call our approach RD and D, Research, Development, and Deployment. I don't need to tell you that the challenges ahead for our cities are many, but so are the opportunities. We see Pittsburgh as an urban laboratory where CMU's core values of problem solving, creativity, interdisciplinary teams, and collaboration will continue to be brought to bear on these challenges, just like you are doing at this exciting Congress. I look forward with great anticipation to the outcome of the workshops 
that are going to take place tomorrow, and it's my pleasure to have had a chance to welcome you on behalf of the entire Carnegie Mellon community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it makes me proud to be a member of Carnegie Mellon to hear an address like that. Uh, I'm going to turn the rest of the evening over right now to Joel Mills, my co-chair. Co and over to you, Joel. Thanks, Don. Good evening, everybody. I have a, a somewhat dis difficult task here in that uh, our next speaker, you really, you really can't say enough about the guy. Um, however, I've known David Lewis long enough to know that he detests hot air speeches, particularly when they pertain to the accomplishments of one David Lewis. So I wasn't about to stand here and read an official biography, but I definitely want to share a little bit about David so that you understand how important he is to this event uh, and to our field at large. Um, you know, David, I, I sometimes joke, David doesn't really believe in uh, individual achievement because his, his entire life has been the pursuit of collective achievement. And just to give you a few illustrations of that, you, you know when somebody truly stands for something when they're faced with a defining choice. And David, very early in his life, was, was faced with just such a choice. Um, as some of you may know, David's... Uh, uh, homeland where he was born, South Africa, and early uh, in his life he applied for a visa to go study in the UK and he was given a choice. Uh, as somebody who was not friendly to apartheid, he was offered the choice to either accept the visa and move on to the UK and never return to South Africa or to decline the visa and never ask for one again. And of course, David moved on and went to the UK. Um, somewhat fittingly, he, uh, he came from the UK to Pittsburgh just as the civil rights movement here was beginning to peak. And of course, David jumped right in uh, and was you know, one of the leaders uh, as we were looking at school integration and some of the first public processes uh, to involve people in the decision making about integrated schools. Uh, he was a huge uh, advocate uh, you know, for uh, publicly driven design decisions. Uh, and he's been a huge educator throughout that process. As, as you all know, uh, spending many years and still lecturing at Carnegie Mellon University where he's affectionately referred to as Uncle David, I believe. Um, and uh, starting the first urban laboratory program there, getting students out into the community uh, to gain real life experience in public processes. Um, he also co-founded Urban, Urban Design Associates, a firm that is not named after its founders, David Lewis or Ray, Ray Gindros, but is about a concept and something that they, they stand for. And they've worked in communities around the world for almost 50 years now, uh, including a lot of work in Pittsburgh that's been transformational here. Of course, David also uh, has, was a longtime leader of the, the RUDAT process, the Regional Urban Design Assistance Teams of the American Institute of Architects, um, which is now a 46-year tradition uh, that has worked in hundreds of communities across the country and been responsible for a lot of urban transformations from the Embarcadero in San Francisco to the Pearl District in, in Portland, downtown Seattle, Austin, etc. Um, he, was, he was one of the main uh, movers and shakers of, of that program for decades and wrote the only book about the program in the mid-1980s with Peter Batchelor. Today, this, this Congress stands, stands here because two individuals inspired us to reconvene and, and start a conversation again. One, of course, is His Royal Highness Prince Charles, who we're honoring tonight, and the other is David Lewis. If you want to understand who David is and what David stands for, I will I'll quote briefly from his opening to the Remaking Cities Conference in 1988. And I quote, this will be a conference about democracy, a conference about how to make democracy work, how to improve our cities, how to improve our standards of life. We are all citizens of somewhere who make our input into public life. We are all involved in building communities. It's that spirit that in that statement that encompasses what David has stood for his entire professional career. And I, I'm hopeful that spirit will inspire us again this week 
as uh, we, beginning tomorrow, begin the hard work of building an agenda for the post-industrial city in the 21st century. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the great David Lewis to the stage. I want to, I would like to, Please. I want to award the Pulitzer Prize for fiction <laughs> to, to my friend Joel Mills. This is the first time in his life that he ever won the award. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh my, well anyway, okay. <laughs> I have a great advantage here because these lights that are shining down are so bright that I can kid myself I'm actually talking to an empty room because I can't see any of you. <laughs> and, and that is a, a great advantage. I'd like to just say that uh, there's another advantage, and that's the advantage of growing old uh, uh, and being able to welcome so many wonderful friends uh, once again to the Remaking Cities Conference, which we began 25 years ago. Uh, and uh, and I, it's wonderful to see my friends from overseas uh, that rebel Raza Tony McGann <coughs> uh, and John Thompson, a great planner and architect, and Hank Dil Dittmar again, who is the, uh, uh, the uh, who is head of the Prince of Wales Foundation, and my friend from Dublin, Jerry Cale. It's just wonderful to see him, and of course George Ferguson with his inevitable red pants on. <laughs> Just wonderful. <laughs> so, I'm having a field day. <laughs> Everywhere I turn, there are old friends and friends from many parts of this continent too. And of course, many friends from Pittsburgh. And uh, I'd like to say that in our cities, the vistas that we all share are long and rich. But young or old, we're all here because we care about cities. That's our passion. And each of us brings to that caring our skills and our values. And these are the substance of the exchanges in this great conference. When I first came to Pittsburgh in 1962, the corporate and political leaders had a vision. <clears throat> they would remake this city. The steel mills along our rivers were still in full operation. Air and water were polluted. Inversions filled our valleys with sulfur. The center of the city housed at that time the third largest concentration of corporate headquarters in the United States. Here were U.S. Steel, Westinghouse, Alcoa, Gulf Oil, Heinz, Republic Steel, Coppers, to mention but a few. With good reason, it was called the Golden Triangle. Bounded on two sides by converging rivers, and on the third side by a cross-down expressway, suitably depressed like a moat, 
the golden triangle would be composed of office towers served by radiating highways leading to suburbs far away from pollution and served by shopping centers. The office towers would be sheathed in steel and aluminum and commuters would park their cars in decks below and soar smoothly up to their offices in elevators. Old city neighborhoods would be raised by the federal bulldozer and one by one replaced by slab blocks in set in parklands and the Golden Triangle would be an island of excellence. Like Le Corbusier's Ville Radieuse, this was a top downwards vision. Corporate and political leaders at the top set the goals and planners and architects and engineers were there to realize them. But another force was at play in the United States. It was called civil rights. In what Americans called the world's oldest democracy, the voices of almost 20% of the population were not heard and far less listened to. Martin Luther King was in Birmingham jail, writing his famous letters, while white racists wore bed sheets and pointed hats and burned churches. <coughs> Neighborhoods and schools in the major cities were segregated. People of color could not stay in the same hotels as whites or eat in the same restaurants, or share the same bathrooms. And then Rosa Parks sat in the front of the bus. And a new history unfolded. A small group of us in Pittsburgh got together in February 1964 and decided that ordinary people should be enfranchised to discuss the goals for their own urban communities. We called ourselves Urban Design Associates because everyone who participated whether a citizen or professional would be an associate in the urban design of their community. At this point, I'd really like to acknowledge my co-founder and my very great friend, Ray Gindrose, who some of you heard from this morning, who have spoke so eloquently at the opening of this morning's proceedings. So let's give a hand to Ray. <laughs> of course, it turned out that we were not alone. Thank goodness we were not alone. It turned out that at the American Institute of Architects in Washington, a group of architects, planners, historians, and economists some of whom are here today, <laughs> aggregated around the great Jules Gregory, a wonderful man, the hair hanging down. And they formed teams of professionals who would volunteer their time to work with any urban communities that requested them. Like us, Jules, and all of those who worked around him, wanted to make democracy work at the local level. 
Over the next few years, Rudettes, as they were called, became a potent national force for change. And their ch technologies, now called charrettes, have become commonplace and are used in, uh, by professional people in many different countries. That was a tempestuous time in the United States. Not only because of civil rights. There were violent protests that occurred against the Vietnam War. There was the women's movement and the gay liberation movement and the communes and the Black Panthers. And there was Selma and the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech. And then Martin Luther King was shot and there were urban riots. And parallel with all of this, in this city came the collapse of heavy industry in the early 80s. In this city, the mills along the Mon Valley shut down. Mills in Youngstown, Cleveland, Birmingham, and other cities also fell silent. Tens of thousands of workers lost their jobs. And it wasn't just here. Heavy industries in the north of England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, the Ruhr Valley, all collapsed. The economy of dozens of towns in Europe were devastated. It was clearly time to rethink how we, as professionals, could serve the future of cities, not by external fiat as in the past, but from within, by forming interdisciplinary teams and working directly with citizens to determine their own urban futures. In the midst of this, an unlikely event occurred. The Prince of Wales made a famous and courageous speech in London calling attention to the, to the plight of working class towns and families in the industrial north. Towns like Liverpool, Glasgow, Sheffield, Belfast, Paisley, Wigan. And shortly afterwards he came to Washington and met with a group of us at the AIA to learn a little bit more about rudettes and how we did them. At the close of that meeting, it was a wonderful meeting, the prince tugged my sleeve and said to me, we must find a way to continue this dialogue. And that was how this all began. The idea for the first International Remaking Cities Conference to be held in Pittsburgh with the Prince of Wales as its chairperson and to be dedicated to the memory of Jules Gregory emerged from that Washington meeting at the AI. As we all know, Prince Charles arrived in Pittsburgh for that first remaking conference in a blinding snowstorm. <laughs> Some of you might think that was rather appropriate. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. <laughs> but the, the conference was attended by 600 delegates from Britain, Ireland, Europe, 
as well as from all parts of the United States, and it was an enormous success. We held a rudette in the Mon Valley, and several of those international conferees and the Rudat people are back with us here today, including Tony McGann and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 others. It was just wonderful. As part of the 1988 conference, the Prince toured the Mon Valley. I accompanied him and saw how affected he was by, by the great steel mills that were still standing, black and silent, and by the by mill town decline. Main Street shops boarded up, unemployed steel workers in the streets, and the erosion of residential neighborhoods. And we talked about the parallel with northern British towns. I only wish that this gentle and dedicated man could be with us again today, 25 years later. He would be astonished, I'm sure, to hear that Pittsburgh has recently been rated as the nation's most he would find that the island of excellence is no longer an island, but a downtown neighborhood with corporate towers enriched with hotels, shops, restaurants, a conference center, loft apartments and condos, a theater district, squares, river walks, a university, a park, and a rubber ducky. <laughs> He'd find regattas and pleasure boats and rowing eights on the rivers. He would find inner city neighborhoods in the process of revival with residential restorations and streets filled with young people. And he'd find our great universities and colleges, hospitals and laboratories, and the sound center and stadiums. But in the Mon Valley, he would find that progress is a lot slower. He might be seduced by finding in Homestead a fully developed 300-acre brownfield with shops, theatres, housing, hotels, offices, and research centres, river walks and bike trails. But if he looked a little bit further, he would find also a network of small steel towns in the Mon Valley, Homestead included. That are deeply depressed. Their housing stock has been purchased by absentee landlords who lease them under Section 8, under Section 8 to low-income families and who and who, who thus lock those low-income families into poverty. Yet this residential stock, 90% of which is repetitive patent book housing, and it amuses me to see that our logo includes patent book housing, represents a huge potential for redevelopment by a new generation, if only we could get them there. A new generation that might be attracted to pedestrian scale communities, each with schools, a traditional shopping street, churches and parks, and with streets of historic pattern book houses that are ripe for restoration. And it gives me enormous pride that my daughter Anne is the director of the Mon Valley Council of Governments 
and these are her goals. And Anne, you are a hero. We've come a long, long way since the first Remaking Cities Conference. Our great achievement is that urban design, performed by interdisciplinary teams working directly with citizens, is now the established way to go in almost every major city around the globe. We've learned to listen to the voices and the hopes of citizens and we've learned that streets and buildings, and not only people, have their stories too. We've learned that there's a difference between history and tradition. History lies in the past. Tradition is the bridge between the past and the future. Tradition is the essential key to our urban agendas. There is a great body of achievement in a number of cities, as we've heard today in our plenary sessions, in Swansea and Liverpool, Liverpool's marvelous stuff, and Bristol. And not only, not only in those countries, um, but uh, we can draw invaluable lessons from the United States as we move here in this country. We have resources of a growing number of universities and institutions, now including the Remaking Cities Institute, the idea for which grew out of our conversations with the Prince when he was here at the first, first meeting, the idea of forming an institute that would be parallel with the, uh, with the Prince of Wales Foundation in Britain. And we have the Urban Land Institute, the Congress for New Urbanism, and many other wonderful institutions. But let's not kid ourselves. We still have a long way to go. It gives every one of us great hope to see professionals and citizens from so many fields and so many cities at this conference, the overriding theme of which is how can we move forward effectively to, to work openly together with citizens to achieve our common goals. And now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our great champion of all of our efforts, the Prince of Wales. Thank you all very much.